Thank you for the reminder, Rabbi. I got possessed. I was busy with other things. I appreciate the reminder. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. All right. So we are beginning our fifth class, I think, on prayer. And um, the final class, hopefully, before we start to talk about uh, the Amidah itself. Okay. So we've talked about a lot of different philosophical aspects of tefillah, of prayer. Um, we are tonight, we're going to talk about minion uh, and then the language of prayer. And then we'll go from there. Okay. So we know there's a concept of davening with a minion, of praying with a quorum. Um, one of the more interesting questions, not so interesting, it's interesting because of the quote, quote unquote Kiddush and Chil Hashem aspect of it. But somebody asked me, if they should participate in a minion, they were in a JCC in a particular town, it wasn't here in Los Angeles. And uh, they, um, and, and he was at, they had six women and three men and they asked him to join their quorum. Obviously it was not an Orthodox minion. And he asked me what was the right thing to do? Should he join their minion or not join their minion? Okay. So without going into what I told him, right now. I only bring it up because it was one of the more interesting questions that I've gotten uh, in Westwood. Rabbi Israeli and I have a file, it's called Unique to Westwood Shilas. Um, <laughs> Rabbi, I'm flying on a plane on Shabbos, can I bring my tefillin with me? Uh, that was an actual Shila that I got in Westwood. You know, I don't, I'm not saying you wouldn't, I wouldn't get the Shila in other towns, but Rabbi Israeli and I have this, um, you know, secret file. Go ahead. Let me, I'm trying to unmute you though. Hold on. You have to you have to unmute yourself. I just I just wanted to mention that many years ago when the Kahila was first starting and we were at UCLA Hillel and Heim Seidler Feller had a minion there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we traded two women from our minion for two men from their minion so that we could all have all have a minion. That's fascinating. <laughs> Was, did you have a rabbi at the time? No. I'm trying to think about whether or not I would, I would do that. Because I'm, I'm enabling them at the same time as helping myself. So I'm not sure it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, I just, it just seems in line with what you were saying. Uh, yeah. Rabbi, I'd like to hear your answer to that one. To which one? <laughs> to what Greg said. Would you have allowed Greg to do that? I, I, I have a hunch that I would not have allowed because I think I'm, ena I'm enabling someone to do So something. therefore, neither group would have a minion. Right. But, but without it, their group thought they had a minion. You say, you say either way, they're going to do what they're going to do. So I'm not enabling them. Yeah, yeah they were going to dive in anyway because they had more than 10 people. And either way, they're going to do what they want to do. So therefore, I'm not enabling them. I'm not helping them do something that I consider to be wrong. Either way, they're doing it. Okay, that changes it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's a good, that's a good Westwood Shiloh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. you, can mute, you can mute me again. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I'm glad I unmuted you. That was a unique one. All right. <laughs> praying in public. Praying in public. Praying in public is the wrong way to say it. Public prayer. There seems to be something about the power of the group that at least on, on some level makes it more readily acceptable before God. The Rambam writes, in Hilchos Tfila, that there's a special merit to communal prayer. Special merit to communal prayer. He says that communal prayer is heard. Now, again, I don't know what heard means. Um, it, we're going to see in a little bit that there is there's an aspect of, of praying. Um, well, I'll leave that for now. The Rambam says, Tfila satzibor nishmas tamid. The Tfila of the community is heard all the time. And then he says, I feel even if some of the people were transgressors amongst the congregation, Hashem does not reject the prayers of the many. There's something about many people praying together that gives it more value than an individual. I, if I'm not mistaken, Reb Chaim Volazhin, and I don't have this source in front of me, but Reb Chaim Volazhin, who's the Vilna Gaon's primary student uh, um, in his book, in Efesha Chaim, if I'm not mistaken, he writes that although a person who's davening on their own, Hashem does hear their tefillah, 
you have to have such complete kavana that you're not distracted at all. But if you're davening as part of a minion, even if you're distracted at times, Hashem overlooks it. That's very much in line with what the Rambam is saying, and that is that there's an aspect of communal prayer that Hashem hears it more readily. And therefore, the Rambam writes, a person should attach themselves to a community, not pray individually, and every opportunity you have, you should pray together with the community. Now, last week, Marlene asked me, what about women? Does the same obligation apply to women? And the answer, of course, is no. That although it's true, men and women are both obligated to pray every day, uh, the obligation of davening, the idea of davening with a minion is, is specific to men, and um, women can daven wherever they like. That being said, it doesn't mean that a woman who doesn't, a woman who does daven is an interesting Gemara. There's a Gemara that speaks, actually, there's a fascinating Shaila. Let me, I, I, I pulled it up tonight. Let me see if I could find it quickly here. Um, Here we go. Let me see if I can find it quickly. It was a certain, the Gemara tells of a, of a woman who, um, who was very old, very lonely, unwell, I guess, and she lost interest in living. I would say it's hard for us to imagine such a thing, but it's not true. You know, there is, we can't imagine such a thing. Unfortunately. Um, I'm just looking, looking for it. Give me one second. <coughs> Trying to find it to give you the exact. I'm sorry, I apologize. I can't find it offhand. Okay, it's all right. Nevertheless, I saw it tonight. I can tell you what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that there was a certain woman, again, who was very, very, very elderly, very lonely, very unwell, but she just outlived. You know, she outlived all her friends. Yeah, you know that expression? Um, I've done for some funerals for some people where no, no friends came because the person had outlived all their friends. And it helps to have two friends from different generations, I guess. Anyways, this particular woman wanted to die. So she went to the rabbi. Uh, the Talmud brings a story. She went to the rabbi and the rabbi told her, um, and the rabbi told her that uh, he asked her about her, like her situation, whatever it was. Apparently she'd been davening with a minion every single day. And so he told her, stop going to minion. And she stopped. Um, for three days, and then she died. So that's the story the Gemara brings. It tells you about the, that the power of minion applies equally for men and for women. The obligation for men and for women obviously is going to be different. It's very much related to the whole discussion about how women are exempt from mitzvot saseh shazman grama, which is mitzvot, which is positive commandments that are uh, determined by a particular time. They're time-oriented mitzvot. And that has, it's very much, very much has to do with that whole concept that women are exempt from those mitzvot. Um, that, of course, is a sheer, or many sheer in by itself. It's a, certainly an area of study. Um, but that is the concept of why women might be putter, but, or exempt. But the idea that fila in bitzibor is helpful or more powerful for men and for women, that is certainly uh, going to be true. I'll tell you something fascinating. My sister, Alea Shalom Rifki, who passed away in 2001, when she was, um, I don't know, Michal, maybe you remember. I forgot how old she was. I don't remember if she was in high school. If you listen to this. I don't remember if she was in high school or if she was uh, back from seminary. But during Elul, she went to Rabbi Besachel every single morning. And she, she davened with a minion at 6.45 in the morning. She davened with a minion. And she, um, she went to hear Shofar every day. I think that's why she, I think that was her motivation. 
Uh, but, I think but it was when she came back from seminary. That's when it was when she went to seminary. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So she was, you know, 18, 19 years old. Thank you, Michal. Um, Michal is a longtime family friend. So I can ask her about family memories that, I, that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm short on the detail for. Okay. Um, That's only if I can remember. Of course. Now, th there are, there are, um, there are, Shuls, our shul, we know that with certain women were saying Kaddish, obviously, women are welcome in our shul any time. And even now with the outside situation, we still accommodate women and women are always welcome. Uh, it's very rare though. I mean, I've been to, I've been to Yik on a, on a weekday morning and there too, there was, they have a section for women, but all the women who are there are saying Kaddish. Now I'm not saying women are obligated to say Kaddish, I'm not getting into that discussion right now, but if a woman wants to say Kaddish, there certainly is a room, room and she certainly is allowed to say Kaddish. And, um, and so the, some shuls do make an allowance, quote unquote, for that. And they'll make sure that women have an, a, a, a seat or a, you know, a, and a, a place for them, even when the place where they're davening is kind of temporary, okay? Um, obviously we do that at the West of Kahila as well. But it's for women to go attend shul regularly as part of the minion, um, I think in the, my nine years here at the West of Kahila, I think, I think in a non-Kaddish situation, I think Orna is the only woman who came on a regular basis. I think so. It's very, it's very uncommon. But the power of davening B'tzibor that the Ramam is speaking to, the power of tefillah that Hashem listens to it. And Herb, we're going to get to your question soon. You're correct about that, what you wrote about. But that is also, you know, certainly equal for men and for, and for women. Any questions about women davening? What women have to daven is a whole separate discussion. Uh, do they have small children? Do they not have small children? Do they, you know, mariv, not mariv? I'll tell you the, I'll tell you an interesting thing. I have a relative, a relative of mine married into a certain family and that family is much more quote unquote yeshivish, okay? And by that, it means that culturally they're much more from, but religiously, not necessarily. And the example, that was that was given to kind of differentiate between two, between the two families was that in my family I'm not going to go into which family exactly because I don't want to give away too much information in the public forum like the women daven shacharis min chamari it's just a normal thing for the women to do and this other family which was much firmer at least superficially culturally right so then uh, that was um, something the other family did not do what about a minion on Zoom. I'm not aware of any Orthodox schools that have a minion on Zoom. And the reason is because in order to have a minion, you have to be in the same room. You have to be in the same physical space. And that's why um, there's no, you, you, that's why you can't do it. Um, Megillah is going to be an interesting question. The Megillah is going to be an interesting question. See, Echa, there's no obligation to hear Echa. So you can, you can do it on Zoom. Um, What other example? Uh, some shuls, oh, Yizgar. Yizgar doesn't require a minion. There's no reason not to do it on Zoom. Kol Nidre, many shuls did Kol Nidre on Zoom. Kol Nidre doesn't require a minion. What requires a minion? Kaddish, Kedusha, Baruchu, and uh, Chazar Sashatz, and Kriya Satora. Those things require a minion that without it, without those things, you would not, um, you would not say them. Does Purim require a minion? Which, which, which aspect of Purim? The Megillah? I can, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, the Megillah. So the Megillah does not require a minion, which is why um, you can have, uh, you know, a, let's say, you know, when we have our second reading in, at Sharon's home, which is what we've been doing for many years, so there could be three men and seven women, you know, it, it doesn't, or you can have three men and two women. It doesn't matter. The numbers don't make any difference. A minion is not required. However, um, Kriyasa Megillah may be similar to Shofar, which is something that you actually have to hear. And if you're listening to it through the medium of, the, of technology, the same way you can't use a microphone, so you shouldn't be able to use a computer either. That's my, my initial assumption, but I'm sure that it's going to be a lot of discussion about it. Well, yeah. you should let us know, Rabbi. I <laughs> do, fully intend to. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Uh, I have another question here on the chat. 
Uh, why do some things require a minion and others don't? Very, very simple answer to that. The Mishnah and Megillah um, talks about what requires a minion and what does not. And where is it learned from? So that's already a halachic sugya, an area of, of Talmud that we can learn together to go through and see where it comes from. But the Mishnah Megillah says these things require a minion and those things do not require a minion. You ask me why? So that's a second, second, second level question. First level question is, how do I know some things require a minion and some things don't require a minion? The answer is the Mishnah says it's part of the oral tradition. Or really, as we're gonna see, that who established tefillah? Well, tefillah by itself, the idea that we pray obviously is from the Torah itself. But the way that we pray, and, and including Kaddish, Kiddusha, Baruch Hu, all that comes from the men of the Great Assembly. So they said, when they set it up, that certain things require a, a minion, and that's how it's recorded in the Mishnah. So I'm not explaining why as much as why some things do and some things don't, but I'm not telling you why certain things do require it. It has to do with the level of holiness associated with it, um, but again, that's we can look at the Gemara and do a separate, you know, a, a level, a deeper sort of a, a study together. Okay. Um, second, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, there's some questions about. What should a person daven? And it depends on what time you're davening. So I'll just answer very, very briefly, okay? Because the details are, um, are not really for right now. But let me just answer very briefly because uh, I won't get to it otherwise. Um, if a person is davening chakras and we're talking about an ideal situation, okay? You have an hour to daven, let's say. You have as much time as you need, quote unquote, to daven. So then you daven brachos, the morning brachos, modeani, the morning brachos, alantil sidayim, asher yotzar, elokai neshama, birchas hatora, and then birchas hashachar, shenasan lasach vivina lavchin ben yom ben loyla, all the way through gomel chasadim tovim lamo yisrael. Okay? We can always do a class where you actually have your article sit around and we can walk through it, okay? So I'm just giving you a very 30, a 30 second version of this, okay? Then you have Mizmar Shir, Baruch She'amar, uh, through Yishtabach. If you're limited for time, so you say Baruch She'amar Ashrei Yishtabach. If you have a little bit more time, there's a couple halukas that you should say, okay? I think it's one, three, and five, okay? Then you have Birchos Kriya Shema, Shema Shmon Esrei. What if you're davening and it's about to be the time for, for tefillah. So let's say this morning, let's say this morning, um, what time was Man tefillah this morning? So Zman Shema this morning was 926, the latest time for Shema. The latest time for tefillah was 952 or 1016 according to the second Zman. So let's say you wake up at 10 o'clock. So what should you do, right? That's a really interesting question. It, it, you're kind of like in no man's land, right? Because if you wake up after 1016, then you just have in Baruch Sha'amar 3 Yishtabach, Shema Shmon Esrei. There's no reason to say the Birchus Kriya Shema, I don't think, after that time. It gets a little bit complicated, okay? Um, but, and, but, and then you could dive in Shachris all the way until Chatzos, but you wouldn't dive in, you wouldn't bother with the blessings on the Shema. Really? Yeah. So I shouldn't after it's Manfila before Chatzos. Really? I think so. Yeah. I should then? No, you should wake up earlier and dive in everything you should dive in. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, once Chatzos has happened, which is today is 11.55, it's too late to dive in Chacharis. And there might be... Um, I don't know what you mean by shame, but there might be... Maybe there's a reason to dive in two minchas. That's a separate conversation, okay? Um, okay, let's leave that. Again, there's a lot, there's a lot of detail involved, okay? But uh, yeah, no, not, when I say Shema, I mean all three paragraphs of Shema. Okay. Um, okay, now for people who have uh, young children at home, 
I mean, for Shandy, the nicest thing for Shandy about vacation days when the children are in school and, and we're off is that she gets to daven the whole davening. That for her is one of the highlights of her vacation days because on a regular day, weekday, it's impossible. She's not obligated to wake up at 5.30 in the morning to daven before the kids wake up. There's no obligation for her like that, okay? Um, I would, how well you could daven the whole day? You could daven any time. Okay, that was one of your questions. Okay, um, mommy, I know you're on now. Welcome. Um, how old was Rifki when she went to her best shul during LL to hear chauffeur? You can chat it to me or you could say it up to you. She was in Beis Yaakov. She was in high school. She was in high school. Oh, she did it during high school. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, Michal, we stand corrected. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, I mentioned before this very interesting Gemara about the power of prayer when you're part of a community and how that applies for women as, as equally as it does to men. And that's true. Nevertheless, Rabbi Becher writes in his book, Gateway to Judaism, he says as follows, the essence of prayer is internal. It develops the personal and private relationship between God and his creations. Some of the greatest examples of prayer took place in complete privacy. Moses prayed to God to forgive the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf as he stood alone on Mount Sinai. In biblical times, a woman named Hannah, Hannah excuse me, prayed in solitude for a child that she desperately wanted. She later became the mother of the prophet Samuel. In fact, many of the laws of prayer are derived from her heartfelt prayer. Both men and women are obligated to pray to God every day. Women, however, are not obligated to participate in the public external manifestations of communal prayer, rather in the ideal form for women, individual prayer. In fact, even a brief personal prayer would fulfill a woman's obligation to communicate daily with God, which is why Shandy, before she'll eat anything, she'll, she'll say brachos, and she'll have a personal prayer between her and Hashem, even though she is no intention of davening the Amidah, um, because that's the, uh, at this stage of her life, that's what her obligation is. Men who by nature are less private and internal, are obligated to pray with a community in the synagogue. And he talks about how you need 10 men. Okay, fine. All right, the, until now we've been discussing <clears throat> the concept of davening with a minion. We're gonna say one more thing about that in a moment. But before we do, let's talk about the language of prayer. I know, especially in our shul, the language of prayer is always a very interesting topic for people. Some people read Hebrew very, very well. Some people don't read Hebrew almost at all. Some people read Hebrew and they think they read Hebrew really well, but really they, they don't. Um, some people think they're saying all the words, but they're not. We have, we have a whole mix of people in our show, like every show. I just described every show, by the way, okay? Not just our show. Um, by the way, what's the trick to learning to read Hebrew? Anybody know? How does one learn to read Hebrew? One word at a time. What did you say, Myrna? I said one word at a time. One word at a time? Yeah, Andy got when it. The, when we're learning the prayers. Andy says- When we're Andy, learning the prayers. Yeah. Go ahead. A Andy's correct. It's the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice. The only way to, to improve your Hebrew reading is by practice. It's, it, obviously, there's the technical aspects of, of reading Hebrew, okay? And there's the vowels and the letters you can, some, an adult can learn those in a very short period of time and then sound it out super slowly. But the only way to improve on one's Hebrew reading is to read Hebrew. And obviously davening is an easy way to do that. Um, if somebody has a language, there's something in the brain that doesn't allow them to learn new languages, I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying for, the, for, for most people, many, many adults have learned to read Hebrew pretty well, even as adults, which is pretty amazing. Um, look, it helps that we have the vowels. It helps, certainly helps to have the vowels. Um, there are tricks, you know, large font, vowels, all those kinds of things help. And we know that our Jewish prayers are composed and conducted in Hebrew. Does God really care what language we pray in? And that's the discussion for the second part of tonight's class. I'm going to be offering different sources that speak to this topic. Just hold on 
with your questions until we finish. Because when we get to the end, actually, you know what? I'll do you a favor. I'm going to read Rabbi Yosef Karo's, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to read to you from Okay. The Shulchan Aruch says, okay, and the Shulchan Aruch is the code of Jewish law, it's what we follow. Shulchan Aruch writes that, that one may pray even when they're alone, meaning not part of a minion. We'll see there might be a distinction according to other opinions. But even someone who's praying alone, asking for one's personal needs, can pray in any language that one desires. So can you dive in any language you want? Yes. That's the bottom line, okay? But let's take a look, though, at some of the... At, at some of these sources leading up to that conclusion. Because we'll learn some interesting things along the way. So I'm sharing with you the end game so you don't get nervous, okay? But the, the bot, but, and that's the bottom line as, as someone in our show says, Rabbi, what's the bottom line? You know, they don't wanna hear all everything in between. The, uh, but I'm giving you the bottom line is you're allowed to dive in any language you want. Okay, now that you know that, let's take a look at some of the sources to speak about it. The Mishnah teaches us in Sota that one may pray in any language. So that's what the Mishnah writes. Now, one that when does not paskin halacha, which means we, one should not decide halacha from a practical perspective. Just by simply reading the Mishnah. The Mishnah is simply a Rabbi, we lost you. Rabbi, we lost you. How about now? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, but we, we, the, for the last 30 seconds, we did not. Okay, thank you for telling me. Uh, the, the Mishnah, one should not pask in halacha. One should not decide halacha based on reading the Mishnah. Why? Because the Mishnah is just a snippet, a snapshot of the oral law. And there's much, much more to it. The Gemara, of course, elaborates on the Mishnah and tells us more about what discussions came out from the Mishnah and what, what else was part of the oral tradition. Um, but the Mishnah tells, you, tells us that one may daven in any language they want. The Gemara in elaborating on this Mishnah says that Rabbi Yehuda taught a person should not pray for his needs in Aramaic. Why? Aramaic was the language that they spoke. Aramaic was the language of the times. Because uh, it's interesting, Aramaic is still spoken in certain areas amongst uh, certain Kurds or Iraqis who live in a certain region. They still speak a, a dialect that's very good. That's, that's, we, we recognize some of the words. I'm not gonna say it's exactly the same, but you definitely would recognize some of the words. Uh, I once went to a training. I went to an EMDR training, which is a, a specific type of therapy. And the woman who was training us was a Catholic, a woman who was born in Iraq, and she spoke Aramaic fluently. Pretty amazing. I mean, look, that was the language she learned growing up. So she spoke Aramaic, Arabic, probably French, English. She didn't know much Hebrew or Yiddish, though. Okay. Dr. Sabar also does, you know? Oh, you're, Sabar. you're a neighbor, yeah. yeah. My neighbor speaks it fluently. Yeah. Okay. Rabbi Yehuda said a person should not pray for his needs in Aramaic. Why? Because Rabbi Yochanan said, and Herb, this is what you're referring to earlier. This is the Gemara that says it, that the angels don't pay attention to anyone who prays in Aramaic since they don't understand that language. Okay? Why do we care what language the angels understand? What do you see from this Gemara? Rashi says that the angels assist in bringing the individual's prayers before God. That's what Rashi writes. One of the functions of the angels is that they take our prayers and they bring them up to Hashem. Now, the Gemara, though, says that the Gemara is asking this as a contradiction. The Mishnah says you can speak in any language, daven in any language you want. Rabbi Yochanan says you shouldn't do it because the angels don't understand Aramaic. The Gemara answers it's not a contradiction. One law applies to the individual and the other applies to communal prayer. And Rashi explains that the individual's prayers are not as powerful and you need the angel's assistance to go and present them to Hashem. Communal prayer though, we don't, does not require an intermediary. 
Hashem himself accepts the prayers of the community. And for this reason, at least if, this, if, these, were, if these were your only sources, you would conclude that when you're davening by yourself, it would be better to do so in Hebrew than in English. I mean, unless the angels understand English, just not Aramaic. Maybe that's something against Aramaic. I don't know. Okay. The Rambam uh, writes, okay, so that's part, kind of part one. Part one is you see a differentiation in what language you daven in, whether you're davening by yourself or whether you're davening together with the community. The Rambam in, explain, in his commentary on the Mishnah writes, in which circumstances may one pray in any language? Again, in public prayer, but the individual should strive to pray to God only in Hebrew. Very, very, very similar to how Rashi understands, exactly really how Rashi understands it. But what are you supposed to do if you don't know Hebrew? So the Shulchan Aruch says that Um, I'll read you his language. Yachol is ba'ala b'chala shen shiyirza. Shachanarach first says exactly what the Rambam and Rashi say, which is that a person can daven in any language they want. Hani mi'li b'tzibur, that's only if they're part of the community. Ava b'yachid, if somebody is by themselves, la yispa'ala ala b'lashan ha'kodesh, they should only use the language of the sitter. Then he brings a second opinion. V'yesh omrim d'hani mi'li kishashol tzirachav. Some say... But this applies only when he's asking for his needs. For example, he's dominating somebody who's not well, or maybe there's some difficulty at home. He says, that's, then it's true that you should daven in Lushan Kodesh, in the language of, of the Siddur or the Hebrew language. He says, however, basically that means the prayer established for the congregation, meaning the Siddur, even the individual could say it in any language they want. So at this point, according to this opinion, there is, there's a, a little bit more lenient in which it allows a person to daven in any language they want. It's only personal prayers that should be davened in Lashon Kodesh. But then he brings a third opinion, which, who is Rabbeinu Asher, who, said, who gives us the bottom line, which is what we rely on, which is that a person may daven for anything they want, not just the language of the sitter, but anything, even their own personal needs, they can daven, they can pray for in any language that they wish. Okay? So well, I guess what's the outcome of all this? So the Chavetz Chaim kind of summarizes all this for us. And he says in his Mishnah Bura, which is his commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, the best way to perform the mitzvah is in the original. Um, if a person needs to do it in English, it's certainly, you're certainly allowed to. And he says something fascinating. They gave, and I don't think this applies for people in our show that can't read Hebrew, okay? He says, they gave permission to pray in any language that's only on occasion, but to establish it as a permanent thing, to set up a prayer leader to pray in another language, to cause the holy tongue to be forgotten completely would be totally unacceptable. In other words, here he's telling you Let's think about just the context of what you're going to be davening. He says, if you have a shul that's set up for people who don't read Hebrew, so then the rabbi gets, is asked a question, Rabbi, look, uh, we don't know how to read Hebrew. Maybe we should just pray in English. And so can you imagine, I mean, Rabbi Kaplan would love this, right? Can you imagine the chazan gets up there and he says, um, God, you are the source of all blessing our God and the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God who is great, who is awesome, and who is mighty. Should I keep going? Okay. <laughs> I don't know how far I could take it, um, or how much of it I could take, but <laughs> that, says the Mishnah Bura, we're not gonna, you can't go that far. We, it's, we're not, we don't wanna forget the sitter. The, the sitter is a sitter, it's, it's ideal, it's the, meant to, it's the way that it's meant to be done. A person on their own who, for whatever reason, cannot read the Hebrew or doesn't understand the Hebrew, wants to daven in English, it's okay, totally fine. Even, even if they're davening on their own, uh, even if they're not um, davening as part of a tzibor. Why is Hebrew so important? 
And here I'll share my screen with you because it's a much, a much longer quote. I had mentioned to you at the outset that there's two different essays that are pretty important. One is from Rabbi, um, Rabbi Sachs, Zichron Levracha, Blessed Memory, in his introduction to the British Commonwealth Sitter. And somebody actually sent me a scan of it. If you want it, I'm happy to share it with you. And the other is in the Black Art School Sitter. Uh, Andy, I know you asked me for it. I never sent it to you, did I? Uh, I did send it to you? I did? I don't remember. I don't think so. But um, Andy, you're welcome to just borrow one of those to from Shul. Or if I don't send it to you anytime soon, okay? Um, so this introduction, um, there's a couple different introductions. This one is from Rabbi Nussin Sherman, where he speaks about the inherent holiness to Hebrew, the language of, which is, happens to be the language of creation. Um, but yeah, so let, Shavu, we're gonna get to that in a second, okay? So uh, I told you I would share my screen with you, so let me do that. I'll read it out loud for those who prefer to listen. That prayer is soul talk, that it represents man at the summit of his aspirations for holiness, helps us understand why the language of prayer is Hebrew. It's true that the sages allow prayer in any language, but this is not a blanket permission, nor does it equate Hebrew with the holy tongue with other languages. The Jewish legal authorities frown upon prayer in other languages. Commentator Nachmanides, that's Ramban, shows that Hebrew is the language God used in creating the universe and the language of prophecy. That he explains is why it's called Lushan Kodesh, the holy tongue. And that alone helps explain why the prayers have greater sanctity if they're uttered in Hebrew. The commentators note that no translation can capture all the nuances of the prayers or the prophetic words of God or the sacred compositions of the great assembly and their sublime successors down the ages. What, what, is, what is Rabbi Sherman saying over here from Ramban? What is it that he's teaching? The key here I think is Hebrew is the language God uses. When does God use it? In creating the universe. What's that a reference to? Because I'll say that God created the universe in 10, with 10 expressions, 10 utterances. Same way you have the Aseris Hadibros, the 10, the 10 sermons on the Mount, <laughs> the 10 speeches at Har Sinai. Some are very short, some are a little bit longer. So too we have the Asar Mamorim, or the 10 ling expressions that God used to create the universe. When God gave prophecy to a prophet, it was in that language. That's called Lashon Kodesh. We, in that, look, in davening we say, in davening we say, Ata kadosh, v'shimcha kadosh, you are holy. Your name is holy. Hashem's, so therefore the language that Hashem speaks, by definition, is going to have Kedusha as well. It's going to have that, that holiness too. And therefore that's, that's called Lashon Kodesh, quote unquote, the holy tongue. So we daven in that language, it's God's language, and therefore it's quote unquote better. Okay, the other thing is that he says is that, is that translation doesn't capture all the nuance. Did I, I may have shared with you last week that Rabbi Sherman writes, or in, uh, in the, or, oh no, Rabbi Aaron Schechter insisted in the um, art school Gemaras that it's not, an, it's not a translation of the Gemara, but rather it's an explanation of the Gemara. The same thing is really true of the Siddur. It's a translation, but you can't capture all the nuance in the translation. Art school, I wonder if they have an internal dictionary. They must have an internal dictionary that certain words are translated in a certain way, and they'll justify why it's done that way. But you and I can argue that they could have used a different word or that the word doesn't do the Hebrew justice. So by definition, English is not going to um, be, uh, be sufficient, really, to explain, uh, to explain the sitter. It's just going to be like a, I don't know if a faint echo, but different, definitely an echo of what's actually meant. Okay, let's keep going in his commentary here. Rabbi Dov Bear, the Magad of Mizritch, writes, it's known in Kabbalistic literature that the letters of the Hebrew alphabet were created first of all. 
And thereafter, by use of the letters, the Holy One, blessed is he, created all the worlds. This thought is hidden in the first phrase in the Torah. What does it say? Bereshis bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created es or et, hashamayim ve'et ta'aret. The word et is usually translated as the. The Hebrew word et is spelled by joining aleph, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, with taf, the last letter. God's first act of creation was to create the letters from beginning to end, aleph to taf. The 22 sacred letters are profound, primal spiritual forces. They are in effect the raw material of creation. When God combined them into words, phrases, and commands, they brought about creation, translating his will into reality. There's an analogy in the physical realm. One type of combination of hydrogen and oxygen produces water, H2O, while another produces hydrogen peroxide. I don't know the chemical formulation for hydrogen peroxide. Do you know it? Rifki hasn't taken chemistry yet. H2O2. Thank you. Thank you, Elisheva. Okay. So that's, what is that? Two, what is it, two molecules of hydrogen and two molecules of oxygen? Yes. Okay. As opposed to H2O, which is two and one. And hydrogen peroxide is the same thing as bleach? No. Is that right or no? Anybody know? Myrna? No, bleach, bleach has some other things in it. Okay. Myrna, is there is there um is there a a, a, a... bleach is hydrochloric acid diluted ten percent. Okay, and what's hydrogen peroxide? Is that something? Hydrogen peroxide is peroxide. It's H2O2 also diluted to about 10%. And what's and it used? When you expose it to air, it becomes H2O. Okay. It oxidizes and you end up with water. Okay, cool. Which is why it doesn't last. Okay. So that's why you can't buy it. You can buy it, but you have to buy it in a dark bottle, you know. Okay. Yeah, whatever. All right. Okay, let's go back to the analogy over here. Okay, so he says like this. There's an analogy in the physical realm. One type of combination of hydrogen and oxygen produces water. Another produces, produces hydrogen peroxide. So it is with all the elements and their infinite possible combinations. Similarly, there's a divine science in the Hebrew alphabet. The book of creation, the early Kabbalistic work ascribed to the patriarch Abraham, describes how the sacred letters, it's called in Hebrew, it's called Sefer Hayatzira, okay? Describes how the sacred letters were used as the agency of creation. The letters can be arranged in countless combinations by changing their order within words and interchanging letters in line with the rules of various Kabbalistic letter systems. Each, re each rearrangement results in a new blend of the cosmic spiritual forces represented by the letters. I don't know anything about this stuff. Okay? I'm just reading it and sharing with you what he says over there. But I'll tell you this, if you ever used an, uh, a Sephardic sitter, if you ever used a Sephardic sitter, whenever it says Baruch Hashem, after, Hashem, so our sitter is very simple. It just says Yud Kei Vav Kei, which we pronounce as Ado Noi, Af Dalad Nun Yud. Okay, Svardim pronounce it the same way. But if you look at a Svardi sitter, it will say something like, instead of Yud Kei Vav Kei, it'll say Yud Kei Vav, like two He's, or Yud, two He's, and then a Vav, and then a He, or it's just a different combination of those letters. And each one has spiritual capitalist significance. I don't know what they are. I have no idea. But I, in the, is that true in the Chabad Siddur as well, Herb? It, it could be some of the Chabad Siddur. No, I don't know. Okay, but in the Sephardi Siddur, the Sephardim who are much more Kabbalistically oriented, you will notice that. Okay. That's kind of where you see this idea. Or maybe, have you ever seen um, some shuls or have de decorations of, of uh, letters of Hebrew arranged in the shape of a menorah or Hashem's name, all kinds of different things and, I have no idea what those things are, but there's something. <laughs> there's something to it. And it's all based on this concept. And obviously I, I don't, this is not an area of study that I have any uh, um, knowledge, perhaps even interest in. But the one thing I will, I will say is there, the Hebrew, there are a couple wonderful books on the Hebrew alphabet, which, give, which gives you a lot of interesting information about why it, what an Aleph is, an aleph is a yud, a vav, and another yud, the shape of an aleph. A he is a resh and a vav. And it's open on the bottom, open on the side, and why that is. 
etc., uh, etc. Et um, and there's a lot more there. Um, Andy, thank you for talking about annotation. I'm an expert in annotation. Um, and in the art, Zach is saying in the article Gemara is the same Aramaic word. It's translated differently in English in different parts of the Gemara. Yeah, probably because they want to tell you what's the most useful in that slot, right? I imagine that's why. It's just translated differently. Yeah, I pointed it out to me where he showed me the same word with different translations. Yeah, oh, they have different authors, by the way. Oh, you mean, oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah I don't these know. were these words were like three sentences apart. So right, yeah, yeah. So there's many authors that worked on the article of Gemaras. Um, Andy, your last question I'll get to a little bit later, okay? We can talk about it. Okay. So we're going to take a look at this paragraph over here. Here we go. The same explanation applies to the language of prayer. Okay, and here's the key here. The great assembly had the ability to combine letters, verses, and ideas in ways that unlock the gates of heaven. What does that mean, in, way, in ways to unlock the gates of heaven? There are interesting Gemaras that speak about different Tanoim who lived much later, who knew how to quote unquote ascend to heaven and have come and, and see, find out what's going on. I may, I may have mentioned this already in the Tefillah classes that we were, make reference to this on Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur davening. The Bishmol Kohen Gadol ascends to heaven to find out if all these decrees are really meant to be happening. So, Dancha Knesset Gadol, who lived prior to Bishmol, I shouldn't say prior. Yeah, who lived prior to Bishmol Kohen Gadol, yes, and he could, could be with one of them. They, they, they had access. They spoke the language. They had a passport. So he says, the same language, the same explanation applies to the language of prayer. The Great Assembly had the ability to combine, to combine letters, verses, and ideas in ways that unlock the gates of heaven. Their composition of the prayers is tantamount to an act of creation, which is why it is so important not to deviate from their language and formulation. This is not to denigrate the importance of comprehension and emotional involvement. Prayer in the language one understands is sanctioned by the sages themselves. Surely a well understood prayer is immeasurably more worthy than one that's merely mouthed as a string of uncomprehended sounds. Nevertheless, this, this does not detract a whit from the importance of praying in the holy tongue, merely points out the responsibility to understand the prayers in their original holiest form. So this gives a bit of a, of a, a deeper meaning, uh, a, a little deeper understanding of, I guess, the importance of of davening in Hebrew. Obviously, one who cannot daven in, prayer, in Hebrew should make efforts to learn to do so. And in the meantime, you certainly have, you know, what to rely on uh, and daven in other languages. I want to conclude with a story here. Um, and we'll see what we can learn from this story. Who wrote the story? Let me see if I have it here. Oh, yeah. So this was written by uh, Rabbi Noah Weinberg and Rabbi Yaakov Solomon from a book called What the Angel Taught You. Jeff was visiting Norway, somehow found an opportunity to come to Israel. He decided it's now or never, and he came. Of course, once a Jew gets here, he's got to come to Jerusalem. Once he has in Jerusalem, he has to see the old city in the Western Wall. It's the holiest site, the holiest Jewish site in the world. When he gets to the wall, he's amazed. Like so many others, he feels something. He's unprepared. He thought he would see some old stones and archaeological sites, but he f felt something that I could only describe as heavy. I'm not sure when he lived maybe in the 70s, 80s. He had some sort of spiritual experience. He tells me, you know, Rabbi, it's true. I'm an atheist, but somehow a prayer came out of me that day and it went like this. God, I don't believe in you. I don't know that you exist, 
but I do feel something. So maybe just maybe I'm making a mistake. It's a possibility. If I am making a mistake, I want you to know that I'm not fighting you. I have no quarrel and I have no reason to be against you. It's just, I don't know that you exist. God, the prayer continues. I still think I'm just talking to a wall, but just in case you're really there and I am making this mistake, do me a favor and get me an introduction. Jeff finishes his prayer of his and slowly in reverence backs away from the wall. Just then he feels a hand on his shoulder. He's so startled that he jumps up in the air, turns around and snaps at the fellow who touched him. What's the idea of putting your hands on me? What kind of nerve? The fellow was very apologetic. I saw you praying. I just wanted to ask if you wanted to visit a yeshiva. What's a yeshiva? Asks our hero. The fellow blurts out, a yeshiva is where you learn about God. Jeff looks at me and continues his story. This guy said that it was as if he hit me right between the eyes. I had just finished asking God for an introduction. Here's a guy pulling me by the shoulder and saying, come on, I'll introduce you to God. So of course I'm gonna come, but that guy really deserves no medal for bringing me here. He didn't do a thing. Maybe God brought me here. A year later, Jeff came back to Israel, told me the end of his story. So that one day during the previous summer when he was studying here in the old city, he saw a very pretty sweet religious girl walking by. He said to himself, look at the charm this Jewish girl has. May the Almighty help me meet a nice Jewish girl like this. He didn't say a word to her. Weeks later, he went back to Harvard. One Shabbat morning, he walked into a synagogue, and he actually ran into the same girl he had seen in Jerusalem. He had to say something, of course. It can't be, he said, but you look like somebody I saw last summer in Jerusalem in the old city. She replied, yes, I was there, and I saw you too. You guessed it. They're now married, living in New Jersey. Jeff was an atheist but he got his prayer answered on the spot. Why? There can only be one explanation. The Almighty is near to all those who call unto him, to all those who call unto him in Europe. Okay, it's a cute story about uh, a conversation with God and, a, and a, uh, obviously a, a conversation in English. Okay. Um, with this, we conclude the philosophical, when I say conclude, I mean all everything that's prepared. Um, everything that I prepared in, in the sense of the philosophy of it. Now my job is to go back to Greg's questions and to look and to make sure that we answered all of them. And that's, uh, I'm not gonna do that tonight, but Lena and I will do that in preparation for the next year. And then we'll start to look at the Amidah itself and, um, and learn a lot about the Amidah itself. Um, I have a couple of questions over here. Um, Jerry, let's talk more about that question that you're asking. Uh, when we study the Amidah, okay? Um, because it's, it's, it's much more relevant. We talked about it already a little bit, um, but um, yeah. How about saying Tehillim, Tehillim? You know, we say Tehillim, and you say Tehillim in other languages. I don't see why not. I, I didn't finish the question, Rabbi. Oh, okay, go ahead, Jerry. I, I wanted to finish it by saying- Well, why don't you tell everybody so the, beginning, the beginning of your question? So I said, are we praying for ourselves? Or are we praying with praise and thanks to God? And if so, does it really matter that we don't understand exactly what we are saying in Hebrew because God understands where we're coming from and what we are saying? It doesn't, we, we be praying in God's language. Yeah. And we are saying the words correctly. And if we don't absolutely understand all the nuances and the, fi the finer things of it, does it matter to God if he knows we are praying oh. and we are praying correctly? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's I, the way I understand it is that when you use the language of the men of the Great Assembly, when you use the language of the sitter, essentially what you're doing is you're... you're it's almost like the passcode. You know, you have you have a lock that has a code that you have a lock that has a lock that has a uh, um, I forget a lock. Nowadays we have passwords, right? And you can't get in unless you type in a password. The sitter, in a sense, is the password to God. So you don't necessarily have to understand computer code in order to get the password to work. It works because you type it in. I think it works the same way. Um, Somebody's asking, Hebrew has one word for ideas and in English have many different words. Due to the fact that English is comprised of many different languages and sources, which has added words with different nuances, 
and uses, whereas Hebrew may only have one word that has to serve for all those meanings and nuances. So um, it's a very fair question. I actually think about it the other, exactly the opposite. I think about the exact opposite way. Why do I say that? Because in English, you, ha you have synonyms. In Hebrew, you don't have synonyms. If, if the Malbim and Rav Hirsch are the ones who did the most work on this, the Malbim and Rav Hirsch, the Malbim actually has a safer called Hakarmel. And there he talks about how words that appear to mean the same thing actually mean two different things. So one of the examples he gives is, um, you know, you know how Ashabara, Sasan, Vesimcha, Chasan, Vekala, Gila, Rina, Dita, Chedva. Actually, there's a family here in La Brea. They moved to Israel, but uh, one of their kids lives locally. They had a daughter Ayala, a daughter, daughter Bina, a daughter Gila, a Ditsa, a Chedva. They, you know, they went through the Aleph phase. <laughs> but the Malbim goes to great lengths to show how different Hebrew words actually mean different things. And they're much, much more specific. So Sasson and Simcha. Let's say in Rosh Hashanah and Kippur Davening, we say, Simcha um, le'artzecha v'sasson le'irecha. And the Arzbal says, Simcha is a general happiness and Sasson is a much more intense happiness. So the level of intensity can even be captured by the Hebrew words. And there are no synonyms. So Hebrew actually is a much purer language. Um, and again, you have to understand it, right? But, it's, but actually I think about it the exact opposite way. Um, I'm reading your questions here, hold on. Elisheva, the answer to your question is yes. You don't need a you don't need fully Shomer Shabbos people to be counted as ten men. Um, if you haven't Davin Chakras, is that the question that you're asking? If you haven't Davin Chakras and you wake up, obviously the first thing you do when you wake up should be to Davin, but let's for whatever reason, you had a doctor's appointment, you woke up at a little bit late, you had to run to a doctor's appointment, and by the time you got home, it's already noon, and mid it's past midday. So you can no longer daven chakras. So what should you daven? Uh, for women, this question is for women. Okay. Um, I would, I would, I would probably daven brachos. I would say Shema, even though you don't need to. You don't need to say the Shema. And even just the first paragraph. I don't think you don't need to say Shema. Shema is a mitzvah that's time-oriented, so you don't need to say it, okay? Uh, but I would say it because of the religious significance of the relationship with Hashem. So I would say you should say Shema. Um, so I would say Brachos and Shema. Um, and yeah, and Dava Mencha, yeah. That's what I would do, okay. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying about what Zach said, and I, that I understand. I agree with that. I thought you meant to ask something else, like, wouldn't it be better to dive in English? It's a better language. So, okay, you didn't mean that. Okay, I, got, I guess I got defensive. Um, uh, I don't know, Myrna, the answer to your question yet. I'm just double checking to make sure I got everybody's at, I think. And yeah, the other question you're asking, I'd, I'd rather discuss with you privately, okay? And I think, I think we uh, answered, I, I don't know if I answered any questions satisfactorily, but I think we definitely discussed uh, people's questions and, and hopefully you're enjoying. And I look forward to beginning the Amidah next week, hopefully. I may not begin the Amidah, it depends again on how, uh, on, on how well I answered all of the questions that everybody has emailed me. I hope, I'll go back to it and make sure that we, uh, we did answer everyone's questions, okay? Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Hey, thank you, Rabbi. Always good to see everybody and to be in this social forum together. Uh, likewise. Likewise. Thank, thank you. Agreed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good